Most know the state of Maine for its coasts, parks, and lighthouses. However, inland is a vast area of wilderness, and it's here that our exploration and strange story begins of an abandoned Nazi spy house. Deep within these woods, on the slopes of a mountain, a man named Roy Wilhelm built an ornate and unique large three-story cabin. However, by World War II, this quiet and reclusive man had become a center of attention, falling under local suspicions when seen turning a flashlight on and off at night, seemingly signaling towards the coast, where U-boats actively prowled the waters. Soon the FBI was informed and would investigate Roy, but found no signs of his involvement with the Nazis. The concept of a Nazi spy in Maine might at first seem strange, yet the fears of the locals may not have been unfounded. In the freezing winter of 1944, in fact, Nazi spies had been active in the state. Operation Elster, or Magpie, was a German spy mission created by Foreign Minister von Ribbentrop as a second attempt after the failed 1942 Operation Pistorius, where all eight agents were captured. Like the previous operation, it looked to gather information on U.S. military technology, but also to discover the effects of Nazi propaganda on the public. In September of 1944, as Allied forces closed in on Germany, two spies traveled on U-1230, a type IXC submarine, from Kiel, Germany to Maine, where it lurked for eight days before landing them on a rubber raft late at night on November 29th near Acadia National Park. It was here that despite the sinking of another U-boat and the capture of its spies the day before, the two agents, William Kolpaw, an American defector to Germany, and Eric Gimple, a radio technician disembarked. They were spotted by locals walking at night in city clothing with no hats. But by the time the FBI was told of their sighting, they had gotten a cab and made it to New York City. On their persons were a hundred diamonds and sixty thousand dollars that William quickly began to waste on women in entertainment instead of building the radio with which they were meant to transmit Morse code messages. Eventually, William stole $48,000 of the cash and set up in his own room at Hotel St. Moritz. William then met with an old school friend who agreed to help turn him into authorities. Gimple was then betrayed by William, hoping to use this to avoid the death penalty. During their trial in February 1945, they were both convicted and sentenced to death. This was later commuted by President Truman to life in prison, and both were paroled by 1960. It was against this background of real-life espionage and paranoia that Roy found himself the center of an FBI investigation. But what was the real story of this man who lived deep in the woods in this one-of-a-kind mountain cabin? Roy was in fact from New Jersey and born in Zanesville, Ohio in 1875 and later moved with his parents to Teaneck, New Jersey. It was here that the family built a house and a carriage house in 1909 designed by architect Louis Bourgeois his mother had converted to the Baha'i faith, which he resisted. Roy would then have a vision of a man in a robe taking his ring off and putting it on Roy's finger, and then wearing Roy's own ring. Roy later joined his mother on a trip with her to Israel in 1907, where he met Baha'i leader Abdul Baha, who he recognized as the man in the vision. Soon afterwards, they began hosting meetings of the Baha'i faith at their house. On June 29, 1912, Abdul Baha himself visited the family, holding an event called the Unity Feast, where he gave a speech with 450 in attendance. At the feast, he told the Wilhelm family that their house was blessed, and afterwards the family decided to erect a unique log cabin on the property for use by the faith. They were later sent a tablet commemorating the event. Roy, his friend Curtis Kelsey, and Bourgeois set about the new project using stones collected over his lifetime to build its fireplace and white cedar logs from Canada and local spruce for the main structure. Around the cabin were added rock pools, paths, and fountains, and inside the house were shell fixtures and rooms for workshops used in woodworking, smithing, and other crafts. In time, Roy would inherit the property and donate the house, cabin, and carriage house to the National Spiritual Assembly of the U.S. and Canada. It was used for meetings by them with Roy as treasurer until 1939, when the headquarters were moved to Wilmette, Illinois, where Bourgeois had built them a massive new temple. Today, Roy's former property remains in use by the Baha'i with an expanded memorial to the feast. By this point, you might be asking, who are the Baha'i? 
They are one of the newest religions in the world. I was a bit surprised myself by their involvement in our story, as I found them interesting enough to do a previous study on them while in college for anthropology and history. The main beliefs are the worth of all religions and the unity of all peoples. They believe there is an all-powerful God who reveals themselves through manifestations of God or immortal messengers who include Jesus, the Buddha, and Muhammad. The beginnings of the faith are complex, starting with a man called the Bab, meaning the gate, who lived in what was then Persia and is today Iran. In 1844, the Bab started preaching the coming of a new prophet who would be the next in line from Jesus and Muhammad. The religion quickly grew and gained the negative attention of Islamic clerics who had him arrested. He was put on trial where he claimed he was in fact the hidden imam and messenger before being executed by firing squad in Tabriz, Iran city square in 1850. Soon after, in 1852, two Babis attempted to kill the Shah in revenge for the Bab's execution. This was used as an excuse to unleash pogroms that killed over 20,000 Babis and saw mass arrests and exile. Many were brutally tortured or tied to cannons and blown apart or hewed in half with swords. During this time, a Babi follower named Bahá'u'lláh was arrested and later exiled from Iran. In 1863, he stepped forward claiming to be the Bab's prophet and was exiled from Iraq and then imprisoned in the city of Accra, later dying in 1892, still under arrest by the Ottomans. Persecutions continued with examples made of followers like Akka Bazurg, a 17-year-old bearer of a tablet message to Nasirid Din Shah, who had him arrested, branded with irons for three days, and had his head beaten in with a rifle, and his body tossed into a hole with stones heaped onto it. His son, Abdul Baha, was also imprisoned and held for over 50 years in Accra, until 1908, when the Young Turk Revolution freed political prisoners. At the age of 64, he then made trips to Europe and the U.S. On his death in 1921, his grandson, Shoghi Effendi, became the religion's head until he died in 1957 without a successor. Today, there are over 5 million Baha'i spread around the globe, and their religious center is in Haifa, Israel, at the Shrine of the Bab. To this day, Baha'is suffer persecution across the Middle East, especially in Iran, where a campaign including random arrests and executions, the closing of schools in the 1930s, the destruction of the Tehran Temple by the government in the 1950s, mass surveillance and propaganda campaigns, forced marriage of women to Muslims, the restriction of jobs and attacks on their homes has been waged for decades. More recently, cemeteries have been destroyed and students expelled and arrested for being Baha'i. In 1982, Mona Mahmoudnezad, a high school girl, was among scores of Baha'i in prison because of their faith. The prisoners suffered months of abuse and torture, attempting to force them to recant their beliefs. They all refused to do so, and ten of them were sentenced to death by hanging. They were killed one by one, forced to watch each other's deaths. Mona asked to be the last in order to pray for them all, and put the noose around her own neck, kissing it before she died, joining her father, who had been hung two months prior. To this day, the modern state of Iran maintains that the Baha'i are a political organization, apostates, and Zionists. It was around the time of the move of the religion's headquarters that Roy made the decision to move himself to the state of Maine for its isolation. It was there he built the cabin that we explore today. This was also designed by Bourgeois in the same style as the earlier house and finished in 1932. Here he farmed goats and was a coffee importer running the firm R.C. Wilhelm & Co., the new house was built partly of stone, in the style of a Swiss chalet, measuring 24 by 60 feet, with five bedrooms, a grand fireplace, a large cellar, and a cow and goat barn. Hydropower from a nearby stream was used and fueled a fountain over the fireplace and sinks in every room. At the house, Roy would invite thousands of guests over the years to stay and enjoy the area, and regularly would send money to the organization and to his friend, Martha Root, who traveled the world teaching the faith. She, in turn, would send him rocks from her journey to add to his fireplace. Roy would go on to write two booklets on the faith, which were translated worldwide and distributed en masse. He was also active in various meetings, and Abdul Baha wrote to Roy, saying, I am extremely pleased with you, because you are a true Baha'i. Your house is my house. There is no difference whatsoever, your and mine. When Wilhelm died on December 20, 1951, having never married or had any children, he left a million dollars in his will to the Baha'i faith. The cabin was then sold to buy land at the Shrine of the Bab in Israel, and Roy was made a sort of saint, being named Hand of the Cause of God by Shoghi Effendi, the religion's then leader.
His grave today lies hidden in the woods below the house with a plaque commemorating his life with words on Roy by Shogi Effendi. Heart filled with sorrow for the loss of the greatly prized, much-loved, highly admired herald of Baha'u'llah's covenant, Roy Wilhelm. A distinguished career enriched the annals of the concluding years of the heroic and the opening years of the formative age of the faith. Sterling qualities endeared him to his beloved master, Abdul Bahi. His saintliness, indomitable faith, outstanding services, local, national, and international, and his exemplary devotion qualify him to join the ranks of the hands of the cause, ensuring him everlasting reward in the Abhi kingdom. In later years, it was eventually found that instead of the flickering of Roy's flashlight being a spy code, it was something far more innocuous. Some local kids recalled flickering their own lights at night while camping, and how Roy would sometimes flicker his back from the mountainside as a game. After the house's sale, the goat barn was used by Green Berets for winter warfare operations in the 1970s as a bunkhouse. Since then, the chalet has sat, frozen in time, on the wooded slopes of the mountain. Let's see what's left of this unique dwelling, half house, half retreat. Rounding the bend, the chalet blends into the trees as if a part of them. A rock-lined trail wraps upwards and at its base an arrangement of stones, possibly related to a past water garden or pool. In its middle is a fountain spout, and this may have been powered by the nearby stream. A winding stone stair with an ornate metal handrail leads to a latticed banister and large porch. The path to the side seems to lead to a black opening in the rock walls. The inside is shelved and appears to be a workshop. Along the basement level, broken windows are framed by twisting vines. The porch wraps to the front with an overhang and balconies that would have given a wide view of the surrounding mountains. Inside the basement is a stone fireplace and what appears to be workbenches. Another look inside shows more shelving as well as sizable holes in the floor caused by water ingress.
Let's head up and see what the porch area looks like. The view from the porch shows a still furnished room with chairs sitting likely were last used by its occupants. Above hangs a ship's wheel chandelier and white birch log balustrades that run the entire second floor. In the dark kitchen, antique refrigerators line one wall. The 1950s decor has seemingly remained unchanged since Roy's death. The main dining and living room is almost too perfect. An old coffee can lies in a seat and an enameled metal mug sits on the table next to it. Over the fireplace, reputedly built with stones from Roy and Martha's travels, once hung an architect's rendering of the cabin and the mountain. Stairs lead down to the basement, but we're going to head up. The relatively spacious bedrooms of the house still have bed frames and sinks. The bathroom has a similar atrocious color scheme to the kitchen and leads into what must have been the master bedroom.
Above this bedroom, the skylights are very visible that flood the main area with ample light. The narrow walkway has areas of rot and we try our best to avoid this while reaching the last two rooms. The mid-sized guest room has a moldy bed and what appears to be an attached bathroom as well as a door leading out to a balcony and chair. The second room is a match to the first. We head back down the stairs, where to the side a screened porch for entertaining visitors seems to lie.
We leave the house and head back down the steps, taking the path behind the building. It winds up and around, and as it does, our battery dies. Luckily, I have my own camera that also does video. This structure was once the goat and cow barn and was later renovated in the 1970s by the Green Berets who used it for winter training. A large stone has been placed marking the entrance walkway. The front appears in worse shape than the first building. Got bunk beds and stuff. It's like a camp. I step inside, and the floor is weak and wet. Bunk beds lie in each of the rooms, and to the left is a caved in kitchen. Kind of rotted up in here. It's all right. I wouldn't risk those stairs or. Yeah. I don't go further as I'd spotted some troubling signs like the caved in roof and the fact many of the posts holding up the building have slipped off their bases. It's just not worth it. As we leave the chalet behind, the scene of the main room continues to stick in my head and reminds me of the opening lines of The Cabin in the Clearing, written by Benjamin Stratton Parker, a pioneer poet in 1883. Backward gazing through the shadows, as the evening fades away, I perceive the little footprints where the morning sunlight lay, warm and mellow, on the pathway leading to the open door of the cabin in the clearing, where my soul reclines once more. In the end, the lesson of Roy Wilhelm and his lonely house is the ease with which we often wrongly judge others. Far from a spy serving an inhuman regime, his life was spent selflessly supporting and aiding a group persecuted and misunderstood by many. The saddest part is that while the legend of his connection to the Nazis remains, few today outside the Baha'i still know the true, quiet, and kind man who came to this mountain to build this wonderfully unique house, lost within and so closely connected to nature. Join us in our upcoming episode as we explore an abandoned Gothic Revival mansion. Until next time.